Welcome back to New World Next Year. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. It is New World Next Year 2019. Our look at stories of this year, 2018, and our trends for 2019. It is the only show of the year where we don't know what the other one's going to talk about. I, I suppose we could we could guess. We could make educated guesses about what the other might talk about, James. So you actually went first last year, Mr. Corbett. So I will go first this year, my 2018 story. You might be able to guess it. A couple months after we moved down here to the American Southwest to be closer to family, I was at a music festival called the Taos Vortex. And while I was boogieing into Thievery Corporation, the real company of thieves were raiding this ghetto-looking little squatters camp that came to be known as the Taos Compound. In summer of 2018, on a remote site with a camping trailer within a surrounding wall of car tires, five adults, 11 hungry children, aged 1 to 15, and later a dead child, were found. Court documents stated the children had been trained for shootings at schools. And that's it. That's all you find when you go for looking about the Taos compound on the bastion of truthiness. A lot of my own media monarchy web links out to mainstream media coverage of this story from August are already dead. Oops, 404, page not found. It's posted actually today as part of local TV station KRQE's top New Mexican stories for 2018. And they just note, in August, authorities raided a compound near Amalia in Taos County. Eleven malnourished children were found. This all started when a man from Georgia was accused of adopting his toddler, his toddler son. After authorities searched the compound, the remains of the missing toddler were found. But as we asked back in August on this very show, when we first covered this story, we asked, what's the FBI's role in this Taos compound scandal? Those pertinent tantalizing headlines that we talked about. Man arrested at alleged child terrorist training compound in New Mexico is son of imam with possible link to 1993 World Trade Center bombing. And then what happened? The authorities partially bulldozed the whole compound. They let this NBC reporter who, as the months have gone by, I found to be a really interesting guy. They seem to kind of fly him around to all the interesting PSYOP locations. A guy named Gotti Schwartz. They allow this guy to just root around through, through the whole crime scene. And then New Mexico, the state, lets him go. But wait, the next day, the FBI arrests them all again on new charges. I still think actually the best kind of bite-sized version of this is Jason Burmes's fantastic video for We Are Change New Mexico Compound Exposed. Because it still seems like another case of, I think, the FBI engineering like some Gladio-style terror. But in this case, it got all fouled up, maybe like things down here in New Mexico so often seem to do. It seems like the wheels fell off of whatever terror op they were cooking up. And then they just rolled everybody up, and there hasn't been a peep about it in three plus months. If you go to search about it, besides that article today of you know New Mexico stories of 2018, it immediately jumps back to uh, three months ago. So the last time anybody talked about this, I wish I could devote more time to the story. As I think one, it shows you know a little bit of what the state might still be up to, fomenting terror, creating terror that they're able to go bust later on. Hopefully, at at best. And this is the one I know about. How many others of these in other small remote towns have gone down the memory hole in some other part of America? And I think, too, I wish I could spend more time on this, James, because since we had just moved down here, I think in a lot of ways it's just kind of become a, a part of my media monarchy narrative, as it were. It's so close to my backyard. So that's my 2018 story, James. I got to admit, I probably wouldn't have predicted that as your story of the year. It is an interesting and important story that we did cover here that uh, did make a lot of fireworks at the time and then disappeared quite quickly, as stories tend to do these days. So I wouldn't have thought of it as the story of the year. Connect, connect it into the bigger picture. What does this story tell us about the way these stories play out in the media? That's that's the thing. You know, they're able to, on a lot of different levels, you'll hear a big hue and cry about things. But as it inevitably falls apart or after, you know, they often note, oh, they, yeah, the correction is in page, you know, H12 of the newspaper, if they actually even run it. It keeps, you know, sort of the, the boogeyman of terror 
put together with, I think, in a new way we hadn't maybe seen, and that is sort of, you know, the Muslim terror and school shootings. School shootings typically done, of course, by our, you know, white American kids. But to kind of smash together the sort of al-Qaeda terror ideas with school shootings is ratchets it up, you know, to another level. I think for me, it's it's just so illustrative of how many things have changed with you know, what's going on in D.C. with the unbelievable state of you know reality politics. But the same old things still keep on rolling on. He's got all the same neocons, and it seems like all the same FBI phony terror ops are going that we've been talking about and looking at for the last 17 years. That's, I think, for if it connects to the broader story, I think it connects to sort of, you know, the specter of terror and how we spend our money and how we are threadagandized. The more I think about it, the more it is a brilliant choice for Story of the Year because it connects to so many different threads, as you say, school shooting and al Qaeda and the child trafficking and the FBI involvement and all of this. I mean, it's, yeah, it's an interesting story and there, there deserves to be more follow-up to it. So I hope if there is any developments, you will keep us surprised in the new year. I will do my best, my friend. What's your story? 2018. All right. Well, we're definitely not stepping on each other's toes uh, this year because I didn't even think of that story when I was going through the stories of the year. Uh, some runners up that I came up with were it was the story of Arkady Babchenko in Ukraine. Of course, the uh, the Ukrainian who faked his own death and then came out a couple days later to say, ha, psych, I'm, I'm still here. Uh, that was a, I, I was really thinking of that as story of the year, not obviously because that particular story was so important, but because of what, again, what it tells us about the media and the way this operates. Everyone runs with the headline, he's dead, he's been assassinated. And then a couple days later, he holds a press conference to say, yeah, we're just trolling you. A crazy story. I wrote about it in an article called How to Fake Your Own Death. Um, that people can look into if they didn't remember that story. Another runner-up for me this year was the Pentagon's failed audit, which we talked about here a couple of weeks ago, and I followed up with Mark Skidmore in a pretty important conversation on the Pentagon's missing trillions that you should watch if you haven't yet done so. But I will also put it in as a side, we, we did accurately predict that story a year ago when we first announced the Pentagon was going to run an audit, and yeah, they weren't really going to run an audit. Well, we were right about that, because they failed the audit. Um... Another story that popped to my mind was net neutrality. Remember, that was going to be the big story of the year because net neutrality is ending. Ah, oh, the internet is over as we know it. Although actually, uh, internet speeds have actually increased in the United States since net neutrality ended. <laughs> it's not net neutrality that turned out to be the big scary boogeyman of the, uh, the internet age. It's another thing, and that's my story of the year, the controlled demolition of social media. And this is a bit of a cop-out because it's not a story per se, it's more like a trend. But I think we can all pick our favorite story in this uh, realm from 2018 because there are so many to choose from, whether it's the deplatforming of this or that alt media figure, or whether it's the uh, privacy scandal after scandal after scandal, Facebook, oh, oops, we let we let all these companies have your info, or Twitter, or all these different companies do it with all their privacy scandals this year, or just the, uh, the, the hearings before Congress and all of this. There's been a lot of motion on the social media platform front this year that has kept them in the spotlight, the news spotlight, in a negative way throughout much of the year. I think as evidenced by the fact that uh, um, nearly half of all social media users have deleted a social media account in the past year, that, that's a pretty strong indicator that people are getting fed up with this nonsense. However, as I pointed out in a, an important episode of my podcast uh, this summer, this is a problem reaction solution type situation where unfortunately we're being set up the problem, oh, look at these big tech giants, they're getting out of control, they've got so much info and data, so the solution is going to be da -da 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 -da, government regulation. We're going to step in and we're going to make Twitter give you a Twitter uh, account and F Facebook is going to have to play by our rules and we're going to straighten out big tech. Don't worry, government will save us. Yay! <laughs> and now you have all these people on the right side of the phony left-right psyop screaming, oh, government, come save us from the big tech giants because we love you now that it's Trump. And in four years from now, or whenever, you know, the Republicans get out of office, it'll be, oh my God, the Democrats have so much power. <laughs> How did this happen? So that's, that's ultimately my story for this year, is the controlled demolition of social media. Because my point is, yes, the social media platforms are in trouble, in a sense. There, there's certainly a lot of trouble. People are angry about the privacy violations and the deplatforming and the censorship and all of these scandals. But 
It doesn't matter if how outraged people are if that outrage is directed towards a non-solution, like we need big government to come in and regulate it. No, as always, the solution is decentralization and finding alternatives to Twitter and Facebook and all these controlled platforms that we know are in bed with the intelligence agencies. Why would you clamor to get on their pro platforms that you know are just platforms of the deep state? I mean, in the end, is that really where you want to be investing your time and money and energy and life as increasingly more people are spending their life on social media? So that's, that's my story of the year. And it's a story that could go either way in 2019. Again, people could clamor for more government to make the, the deep state controlled platforms give us an account, or people can actually search for alternatives. And on that note, allow me to toot my own horn. That is why I did the social media alternatives series earlier this year that was wildly unpopular and largely ignored by everyone. But I think, I hope people understand why I was doing that now, because we desperately do need alternatives. And I will also throw in, as I always do, just the little needle in the mind, just to, just to plant it there for you in that haystack. You know, we don't have to be on social media at all. <laughs> we don't have to devote our life to it anyway, as people are increasingly doing. And uh, people are sleepwalking into the technocratic enslavement state and basically plugging themselves into the Borg Collective with this social media in a way that's, uh, that is frightening. And I'm just saying, you know, look for alternatives, but you don't need to invest your life in social media. James, I think your your uh, your your honorable mentions there kind of had me thinking, and this is where I thought actually you were about to go, and I think maybe some of my own honorable mentions of of 2018 might be this sort of kidnappings, detainments, killings, you know, the, with the Khashoggi, and now this whole Canada and China thing. There's been a lot of this almost kind of old school espionage situation, but definitely kidnappings and murders and detainments are generally, in some ways, at least from the from the public standpoint, how wars get started sometimes. So I think that's another important thing to think about this wild year of 2018, James. My trend prediction for 2018 for 2019? was... Oh, for 20... Well, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to tell you my, my not-so-fantastic prediction for what 2018 was going to be trending on. My prediction for 2018's trend, maker culture will become pop culture. Yeah, I, I, wish, I think I wish I think has definitely entered the mainstream. There's been some good news stories I've covered in this past year concerning 3D printing and, and again, you know, the decentralization. But I'm calling my 2019 trend prediction. If it pleases the bot, I have a dozen recent entries on Media Monarchy that all mention consent. And remember, we've all we've all clicked yes on lots of terms and conditions without reading three words on them. What I'm getting at is the point to where I think we're going to have to kind of ask permission from our smartphones and fondle slabs and devices, and it's already happening. This will, I think, connect to the coming crush of social credit, and I think that will also all be connected to the so-called Internet of Things, or as you should be following if you are on the Twitter, the fantastic account called the Internet of Crap. I've covered this on my morning shows all this year. World's first consent-focused robot brothel in the works for West Hollywood. James, I actually had some Media Monarchy listeners who know those people who reached out to me to say, hey, man, those robot makers are, are pretty much on our side, except for the whole transhumanism thing. So this consent-based robot brothel, the idea of which, meanwhile, got shut down this year in Houston, Texas. They did not like this. I think these stories and these ideas, again, and, and the stores themselves, predicated on stories like this one from a year or so ago, sex robot molested, destroyed at electronic shows. Recent ones from just this past week, I think, kind of tie in. Chinese millennials secure loans with nude photos, a really kind of disturbing story about this sort of micro-loan industry, and you give them nude photos of yourself, and if you don't pay them back, well, you know what happens. 
kids in China, meanwhile, trying to trick, I guess in some ways it almost seems like the girls are selling nude photos of themselves for loans. Meanwhile, the boys are trying every trick in the book to beat this new facial recognition software that puts mandatory time limits on popular video games, trying to take pictures of their like sleeping grandpa's face to let the game unlock. Years ago from Wired, they talked about the murky world of robot sex and consent. But I think these two mainstream articles from this past year, I think, kind of sum up what I'm getting at. One from NBC, robot abuse is real, but maybe this little tortoise can help. A cute little article about a robot that teaches kids about how to treat your robots kindly. The other one from Business Insider, people kicking food delivery robots and early insight into how cruel humans could be to robots. This article notes 2015 study placed a robot in a Japanese shopping mall and found out that when few people were around, children displayed antisocial behavior towards the robot by blocking its way, calling it names, or even acting violently towards it. So many stories about what will the unblinking eye not let you do? I've been joking. I think I've already made the joke here on New World Next Week, James. Do you think the Carl's Jr. machine is just going to let you kick it a bunch? So an actor, a guy named Douglas Rain, the voice of Hal in 2001 A Space Odyssey. The actor Douglas Rain, the voice, he actually just passed away last month. So I've been thinking about him and thinking about what that sort of robot ghost might mean for our very real future. I think robo-consent is something the powers that shouldn't be are going to continue to push in 2019. And that is my pick for the trend of next year. James. I'm sorry, James. I can't let you do that. Uh, interesting, very interesting, thought-provoking pick. Because just when you were talking about that, it did, it did trigger in my memory, going back to the beginning of the internet era for me in the mid-90s, late-90s, when I was a teenager and I was first getting online and first get, getting programs and downloading stuff. And I remember... I was very conscientious about actually reading through terms. <laughs> I would actually read through the terms and conditions before cl clicking agree. And I remember I was uh, I had a friend over and he was like a computer science professor kind of guy and and uh, he was downloading a program or something and the terms and conditions came up and he just clicked agree and do it and I'm like, "Oh, you can do that? <laughs> you don't have to read through them?" <laughs> How young and naive I was. And of course, from that point on, I never read another terms and conditions again. I just click agree. But it is. I mean, we have been trained Pavlov style to just agree and consent and just give ourselves over to this technology and just do what the technology wants us to do. Yeah, okay, whatever, whatever you want. And there is something deep and profound about that as we step into the more and more transhumanist era. And the idea of robots and their feelings and, you know, oh, all of this, it will start to become a real, real reality in the near future. And we're being conditioned for that right now with all these stories. So that's, that's an interesting idea. So let me, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and this is, this is, again, something by doing the, the morning show every morning. By the you know the eighth month of something is like hey I, I'm noticing a trend here I'm going to make a note of that um, James I just want to remind you and remind folks out there of what your 2018 trend prediction was Do you remember what it was Did you look it up before I this? didn't actually look it up What was it uh, I must tip my hat to you my friend Your prediction for 2018 was weaponized social media. <laughs> 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 I am I'm kind of repeating myself. <laughs> it was the story of the year. Hey. <laughs> I was right. Oh boy. Well now I've got egg on my face because you want to know what my 2019 trend was? It's Let's hear Weaponized narratives. <laughs> okay, well, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. Hear me out. Again, I'm kind of copping out because this is such a general trend and it's not obviously specific to the year 2019. It's been going on since time immemorial. It will continue to as long as humans exist on this planet. So this is not specific to 2019, but it's coming to my mind because of some stories that came up throughout the year. For example, a recent interesting article about Britain's 
77th Brigade, which is essentially an online army psyops team that's uh, doing information warfare that is being written up in Wired and other mainstream publications. They're like, oh yeah, there's these info, info ops warriors online that are uh, editing blogs and posting videos and doing things online. And oh yeah, they might kind of engage in some black ops as well and, you know, black propaganda, but we won't talk about that. So, um... Very interesting that those types of stories and JTRIG and all these other militarized info operations are coming to the surface now. I, obviously, again, we've known that they exist and I've talked about it before and all of the, the, the psyops warfare that's that's been waged online, but it's now coming up and is in your face. And uh, if, if the control of your perceptions and your mind and what you were thinking and the way you look at the world wasn't so important, then why would the powers that shouldn't be, why would the establishment spend so much of their time and money and effort on controlling and weaponizing every aspect of the media you consume? consume? Not just the news, obviously the news, but not just the news, also the entertainment. And again, that's something you cover constantly on Media Monarchy, every Friday at least, the way that media and entertainment of course, brings all of its own propaganda and and uh, and mind wash and everything uh, else with it. And uh, I'll just point people to an excellent article that uh, Caitlin Johnstone just recently did about uh, don't laugh, it's giving Putin what he wants, talking about the BBC and others admonishing you not to laugh at these, you know, silly politicians because the Putin is weaponizing laughter and he's making it so that you are going to laugh at politicians instead of venerate them and all of this. It's just, it's getting ridiculous but, and in your face. But I see where this is going. I mean, really, the weaponization of narrative is going to be the key to control for political operations going forward. It always was, but we were, we were used to thinking of that in the old media paradigm, the controlled dinosaur media paradigm with newspapers and radio and TV. It's moving into the internet age. And now that we have a substantial section of the U.S. populace uh, basically waiting for the good guys in military intelligence to go round up the bad guys that only seem to exist in the Democrat Party... 10,000 sealed indictments, everyone. Any day now, they're all going to jail. Trust us. Just sit back and enjoy the show. Get some popcorn. That's your role in this. Just sit back and watch. Just trust. Trust. And don't forget to vote Republican in every election, because that, that, that'll be the key to getting those bad guys. That's how you round up these. I mean, there's this entire narrative that's been spun for the very types of people that would be attracted to the alternative media and independent information to now get them right back on board with the old two-party system and right lock back in step with the old left-right paradigm. It's a marvel to behold, but it goes to show that the weaponization of narrative is the key. It's the linchpin for the control in this system at the moment. And I always bring it back to this point. There is something hopeful in this. Which is that, again, if it didn't matter what you think, if it didn't matter your perceptions, if they could just do anything and they don't care what you think, they wouldn't waste their time propagandizing the public and weaponizing narratives and doing information operation warfare online and all of this. It wouldn't matter. But it does, because your mind does matter. What you do, what you choose to spend your time thinking about and invest your money in and do uh, in the real world, that matters to the system. And they're always trying to tell you you don't matter, but their actions say the exact opposite. So if we are aware that narratives are being weaponized to try to draw us back into the same old, same old Plato's cave where we're looking at the shadows on the wall instead of the real power structure, then if we're at least aware of that, we have a chance of combating that. But unfortunately, with the weaponization of memes and all of this coming becoming more and more a part of the political conversation, people can get swept away via the controlled social media platforms in narratives that they don't even know where they're leading. And that's the worrying part about all of this. James, I, I think for me, the, the, the best insight into the 2019 trend of weaponized narratives I think that we have comes from this year, and I think it would be the Kavanaugh hearings. What a perfect example of this controlled you either think she's a crazy cia nutball or he's a terrible rapist and there's no in between and no nuance I'm like oh why, why why can't i maybe maintain that he supports the patriot act and i don't like any of you know the that's i think a perfect example for why, what the it's coming in 2019 james there's our ninth calendar year of new world next week 
under our belts. We've been doing this since uh, 2009. I tip my hat to you, my friend. It is such a pleasure and a blessing to be able to do this week in, week out, and month in, and now years into it. And as we go into our 10th year, I'd like to put the call out to folks who, again, you know, I think this this weaponized narratives, weaponized social media, it's working in the whole payment system of alternative media right now. And a lot of people, you know, losing support in lots of different ways. So I think as we go into this next year, for folks who are fans of New World Next Week, we've been doing this for a decade. Never heard an ad, never heard a snake oil pitch. We hope that you'll support our work now and going into 2019. Of course, you can find all the links to our pertinent links down below in the show notes. James, always a pleasure, my friend. I will see you in 2019. Yes, you will. And on that note, I know a lot of people are uh, getting off of Patreon and unsubscribing that way. And hey, fair, fair play. They are a controlled platform. But there are other ways to subscribe. You can use PayPal or debit or credit card or crypto. <laughs> you remember crypto, anyone? Oh, the, why do we need that, James? That's stupid. <laughs> well, because every payment platform is controlled and they can censor you at any time. No, I don't want crypto. Anyway, whatever. I also take crypto, so as you do too. So um, people can get in touch with me or you if they want to know other ways to subscribe. And I just have one question for you going into 2019. Are we officially having a beard off here? Because I was thinking you might be shaven for this one, but you're still going for it. Well, you know, I think sometimes I, I, I let it go when I'm in, you know, this this goes back to the moving to New Mexico thing. I think I've been been in kind of an odd spot this past year. Honestly, truth, truth be told, and I never said this on the air, although there's always a bajillion comments about it. My face got infected from shaving back in August, you guys. It was messed up. I looked like the faces of meth. I had to cancel New World Next Week episodes. Ever since then, I haven't shaved because I couldn't. And now the months went by, and I'm like, hey, this is kind of neat. <laughs> I've never grown a beard this much. So I know it drives people insane. I get emails about <laughs> it all the time. But Well, now yeah. I, I, you know, I'm scared to trim my beard now because I figure you're going you're gonna to outgrow me and upstage me. <laughs> oh, well, well, we'll see how that works out in the new year. That could be the, the big narrative for 2019. I know. Well, and then, of course, what? I, I just go back to the to the soul patch and then there'll always be people <laughs> that complain about that, isn't that as well. You know, you can just listen to the audio of these and you don't have to. Listen to these. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Looking forward to it again next year, buddy. Love you, buddy. Appreciate right. you. Thanks. Take care.